Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss one of the important computational problem which also falls in the data pre-processing category for single cell RNA sequencing data. And that is uh, imputation of single cell RNA sequencing data. So in the last uh, lecture where we gave an overview of single cell RNA sequencing, we talked about uh, different problems with single cell RNA sequencing data. And one of the problem was uh, it was very sparse. So we saw that uh, quality control has to be done uh, before the single cell RNA sequencing data is used to answer any biological question. And one of those steps uh, is also involving uh, how to impute this sparse data set. So here you are seeing one example from a mouse bone marrow data. So here there are some canonical markers that you should see in the uh, blood cells. And this is a data set from 2015. So here on the x-axis you are seeing different uh, cells have been clustered into different groups. But if you actually look into these uh, different canonical surface markers, which should be expressed by different types of immune subsets, immune cells, uh, different types of immune cells, then you will see that um, these different markers are actually lowly expressed and um, they are detected at low levels. So this is because single cell RNA sequencing technologies can only capture a certain part of the complete transcriptome of a particular cell. So oftentimes this kind of uh, capture efficiency is below 10% in some cases. So you are observing, you are definitely going to observe a lot of zeros in the single cell RNA sequencing data. Now some of those zeros are actual zeros, so they are, uh, it's biologically the case is that that particular gene is not being expressed in that cell, but some of those are also technical uh, issues, technical artifacts. So you are not just seeing it because uh, the data actually did not capture the transcripts. Uh, the tra transcript was not uh, captured by the technology and uh, subsequently you are not observing any reads corresponding to that transcript of that gene. So for example, in this particular uh, situation over here, if we look into the monocyte clusters, which is again C14 and C15 over here, you will see that uh, only uh, about 1.6% cells are expressing CD14, whereas monocytes, all the monocytes should ideally express this particular marker over here, CD14. And then another marker, CD11B, which is again this one, that was also expressed by less than 6% of the cells. So which is again uh, much less than what should be there actually. Similarly, only 10% of the dendritic cells in the cluster C11 are actually expressing this marker, which is CD32. So we can see that uh, this data set, this single cell RNA sequencing data is very, very sparse. So even though it is very high dimensional, uh, only few entries are non-zero entries. And with this kind of problematic capture efficiency, uh, oftentimes the gene-gene relations are obscured. So what you see over here um, uh, is the relationship between two genes and how they are varying over uh, time. So this is like a true ideal structure that you should observe between two genes. But when we actually fail to capture all the transcriptomes corresponding to the genes uh, in the single cell RNA sequencing data, such identifying such ideal structure becomes very difficult. So because of high dropout, it's very difficult to actually capture two genes of interest in the same cell. If we are only talking about the very highly expressed genes, yes, we can capture them. But if the genes are moderately expressed, it is uh, often uh, the case that we are not going to be able to see all the different possible values of the genes in different cells. So essentially, when we look into the single cell measurement, we are going to see a blob like this, so which is very noisy. So you are definitely not looking at this particular beautiful structure that you should see uh, between these two genes. And this is one of the biggest criticism of single cell RNA sequencing data as well, that this kind of gene-gene relations are actually obscured in the measurement. And uh, the problem is that dropout, this kind of dropout that we see with single cell RNA sequencing data, they actually affect all the genes. It's not the case that dropout will only affect certain genes in certain cells so that uh, they will actually result in the zero value, but uh, this is going to affect the, all the molecules of, uh, coming from all the genes. So essentially, uh, even if uh, we are not observing, even if we are observing some expression value for a certain gene, uh, 
it it can be actually uh, affected by some sort of dropout some amount of dropout so yes maybe we are observing a little bit of dropout in that cells uh, but it is not completely zero but it is still uh, can be an artifact of the dropout whatever we are observing so somehow we have to account for this dropout phenomena uh, so of course in case of uh, extreme in the extreme case uh, sometimes this loss of molecules or this dropout event can actually gives rise to the values which is uh, basically zero so that's why you will see that in the literature a lot of zero inflated distributions have been developed in order to capture this kind of phenomena but essentially we have to keep in mind that dropout uh, essentially affects um, at the same time affects all the genes so the question is what can be done to account for such kind of phenomena or can we actually recover the missing values from that single cell data so to that end this particular imputation method was developed and this is named as magic so definitely i mean uh, it also works like magic and when you look into the effect of this particular method on the data set itself so it actually recovers a lot of hidden gene interactions uh, from this uh, imputed uh, after imputation of the raw single cell count matrix so we are going to take a look into this method in more details so and again this is again a smoothing based um, operations for uh, so basically it's again going to do some sort of smoothing of the uh, cells based on their nearest neighbors and we are going to see that this nearest neighbors are going to be also found using uh, which is going to represent or uh, uh, which is going to respect the geometry of the data itself so let us look into uh, this magic uh, um, method itself so before we actually talk about the method in details let us look into what happens if we apply magic on some of those existing data sets so the data set that we initially saw that was lacking in a lot of uh, the canonical markers what happens if we apply magic on that data set so this is the more marrow data set again so let's apply magic uh, and here we are so we see a lot more information is recovered after magic has been applied so you see a lot of uh, values have been imputed and it actually affects um, uh, so it basically imputes all the values in all possible cells uh, for all the genes and it's not just randomly imputing this is also recovering known structures between the genes that uh, we are going to see how it is uh, achieving that and uh, of course, uh, they actually did a lot of validation of this particular method on different data sets to see if it is recovering meaningful structures in the data after imputation or not. So, the impu uh, so in order to say validate that the imputation is actually not a garbage imputation or rather it's a very meaningful uh, imputation. So, how do we actually go about imputing such values which are missing? So one of the important idea behind this particular imputation is that it is going to utilize some sort of structure in the data. Now we are talking about imputation of gene expression matrix and there are already known knowledges that uh, uh, there are um, uh, existing structures in the gene expression values. So in fact, uh, uh, this here I am showing you some results from a consortium paper which actually measured gene expression values in a lot of different human tissues so uh, across 45 tissues they actually observed that gene expression is actually break, broken down into different collinear modules so in fact they found 117 expression modules so they observed that the genes they actually work in uh, work together so in a particular expression module certain genes will be expressed uh, uh, together so there will be collinearity so they are co-regulated set of genes and because they actually share certain biological pathways or they are involved in certain biological processes so this actually gives us a very powerful cue for the imputation process itself because even if we are not able to measure the genes uh, in, in a particular cell, if we even if we are not uh, measuring a particular gene, but maybe the collinear genes or the co-regulated genes may have been measured. So it's possible to borrow that signal from the uh, co-regulated genes to impute the matrix, uh, impute the gene for which we are observing a zero value. 
and then again, then again we are talking about single cell data and single cell data has another additional structure in it so here what you are seeing is a representation of the mouse intestinal intestinal epithelium cells so here what you are observing is uh, a 2d visualization of the high dimensional single cell vectors so you see how well they actually separate into different uh, groups of cells each dot here over uh, is a cell and each color actually represents the particular cell type and now this cell type is again a phenotype uh, based on the gene expression signature itself so you see they actually separate uh, into uh, very uh, specific groups of uh, or clusters you can say so essentially the cells are associated uh, with a particular cell type and it's possible to recover or represent that underlying cell type or the phenotypic space in a lower dimensional manifold so again this is coming from single cell rna sequencing data but even before single cell rna sequencing data became popular people actually used uh, certain other type of data like flow cytometry data which is again uh, in short known as cytop data so they actually measured a very smaller number of uh, markers let's say 13 or 30 32 something like that but those were also very accurate measurement there was no uh, such errors uh, as you can see in case of single cell rna sequencing data and with that kind of data which was very accurate people actually represented the cells in this lower dimensional manifold and they observed that the cells actually separate out in a lower dimensional manifold and they separate out into groups so essentially there are two layers of structures in the single cell rna sequencing data of course there are co-regulated genes and at the same time cells can also be clustered into cell types so essentially then we can say that uh, the cell phenotypes they can be represented by a uh, substantially lower dimensional manifold so these high dimensional vectors that we are observing from single cell rna sequencing data which is again uh, maybe length 20000 25000 or so we can eventually represent them in a much lower dimensions maybe less than 100 20 25 something like that and we can still be able to separate the cells into clusters and this sort of structure actually helps us in imputing the data set imputing the uh, gene expression values which are really not observed in the single cell measurement now of course we have to somehow represent the cell phenotypes in terms of the underlying manifold and these manifolds are oftentimes very very messy so for example uh, you can see over here that uh, it is uh, in this particular uh, case uh, i'm representing some cells in a 2d um, uh, in two dimensions and this is a particular structure in 2d so it's uh, it's following certain manifold and uh, so there are not like uh, gaussian balls you can say, you cannot say that every time it will be a like ball like structure gaussian ball like structure so maybe euclidean distance may not be a very good indication of uh, measuring this kind of um, distance in the manifold itself so if we talk about two separate cells uh, let's say this one and a cell over this one the euclidean distance is not a very good measure of the distance between these two uh, cells because the manifold is uh, as a different geometric shape uh, other than uh, this uh, Gaussian representation and in fact uh, it can be even very very messy like this so as you can see here there are lots of twists and, turn, twists and turns in the manifold itself and it will be very difficult uh, if we uh, to find the distance between two cells if we are not actually capturing the underlying manifold structure underlying geometry of the data so if you do not respect the geometry of the data and we randomly just uh, compute any Euclidean distance, then that is not a very good measure of the distance between two uh, cells in this particular lower dimensional manifold. So in when we want to impute these entries, then we have to take, and we are trying to take help of this underlying manifold, then we have to actually account for the geometry of the data itself. So if we actually use uh, Euclidean distance, that will give uh, wrong neighbors for certain cells. So that is not a good uh, distance measure. But uh, if we actually take into account the manifold uh, or the geometry of the data, then it can give us correct neighbors. So we have to somehow account for these things.
So it turns out that the cell manifold or the underlying uh, lower dimensional space um, uh, which actually represent the cell phenotypes can be represented using a graph based uh, illustration or graph based representation. So again here I am showing you a graph based representation of the cells from an early paper uh, that came out in 2015. So you see the nodes over here, they are actually representing the cells. Okay, So this manifold is actually then represented using a nearest neighbor graph. So each node represents a cell and edges actually are connecting most similar cells which are similar in terms of their gene expression values. So you see over here the cells are also following certain modular structures. For example, they are very much dense over this region and then very much dense over here. And also uh, there are a smaller number of edges uh, that are connecting, let's say, this particular module and to this particular module as compared to the number of edges inside this module itself. And here on this graph, we are also representing, uh, they are also represented the, uh, the expression of a particular gene or particular marker CD34. So you see this is, this particular no, uh, module is rich in CD34 but whereas this one or this one or the other uh, smaller structures they are not that rich in uh, CD34. So as you can see that uh, this graph based representation can actually capture this cell manifold, this underlying cell phenotype. Now the question is how do we actually build this uh, graph, this uh, neighborhood or the nearest neighbor graph of cells. And that is where the most of the methods um, can vary. So of course a graph can be represented using an adjacency matrix or something like that. And um, that's where we have to talk about how we can actually build this graph. How we actually respect the geometry of the data uh, while building this graph. So that uh, essentially when we use this graph for imputation to find the nearest neighbors, it gives us meaningful set of neighbors. So the question comes down to this particular situation where it is which is uh, how we build this nearest neighbor graph so if we are given this nearest neighbor graph let's say uh, uh, this is represented by this particular graph over here where nodes are again representing cells so if we are given this graph then if we take really big euclidean steps uh, then we are likely to exit the manifold because Again, the graph is closely connected and the graph is connecting only the nearest neighbor of each of the cells. Then uh, taking big Euclidean steps, we can move away from the manifold structure itself. Whereas by taking very small steps, we are likely to stay within the manifold. So that is also sort of the idea behind uh, this magic, uh, this particular imputation method. So we are, uh, they try to learn the global structure, the global nearest neighbor graph by performing small steps, small local steps, which is essentially equivalent to random walk on this particular graph. And essentially this random walk also becomes like a diffusion uh, as we are going to see later on that this random walk on the graph will give rise to a diffusion process and this diffusion process will capture the um, transition of one cell into another cell and that way this sort of transition um, uh, or characterizing this sort of transition matrix will help us to identify the final uh, imputed values or in order to impute the entries in the gene expression matrix we are going to take help from this uh, random walk on the graph which is again going to give rise to a diffusion process. So before we talk, go on to talk about the method, the imputation method in more detail, first let us talk briefly about what is uh, a random walk on a graph. So again, given a graph uh, G with a set of vertices represented as V and set of edges represented as A uh, by the uh, letter E, a random walk on this particular graph will give us a sequence of vertices. Let's denote them by V0, V1, all the way up to something where let's say the t plus 1 at vertex, uh, vertex uh, v uh, underscore uh, v subscript t plus 1 is actually chosen to be a neighbor of vt. So there is an edge from vt and vt plus 1 uh, between these two nodes or between these two vertices there is an edge and the probability of this transition is given by this particular probability denoted as pij. Okay? And this is basically going to give us a transition probability that uh, 
the xt in the random walk that in the, in the random walk which is again a sequence of vertices the xt is going to given by uh, going to be given by the vertex vi given that is the case then xt plus 1 will be vj and that is uh, the definition of the probability pij that is the transition from node vi to vj is uh, given by the probability pij so that is the definition of a random walk on the graph and um, in fact if we actually represent this random walk let's say that we are given this transition probability matrix and then we randomly denote this particular node as our start uh, vertex, vertex this is the vertex from where we are going to start the random walk and then we take a path based on this transition probability let us take uh, this particular path over here then the sequence of vertex 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, this is going to give us a random walk because this set of vertices have been selected based on the transition probabilities. Now you see this transition probabilities. Uh, uh, so for a particular vertex, the probability of exiting a particular vertex is always 1. So the sum of pij is, is equal to 1. And then uh, this has to be specified in order to specify a random walk on the graph. So the transition matrix probability transition probability matrix has to be specified and then this matrix p is known as row stochastic because every row sums up to one so essentially you can see that uh, this random walk can also be represented or it can also be interpreted as a finite markov chain which is again time reversible so i'm not going into the details of all these properties of random walks but Let's now talk about uh, the overview of the model itself and how they are going to utilize this random walk uh, phenomena. So let's look into the overview of the magic method. So we are given this original data, uh, cell by gene matrix. So first of all, the magic uh, method actually calculates some sort of distance matrix between the cells. And after that, they convert the distance matrix to an affinity matrix. So again, the affinity matrix is going to uh, represent the similarity between a pair of cells. And that affinity matrix will be normalized to generate the Markov transition probability matrix. So this sort of uh, Markov transition probability matrix or Markov affinity matrix will be utilized for performing the random walk on the graph. Then the Markov affinity matrix is exponentiated to even refine it even further. And this further, uh, this finally will give us the uh, matrix that is needed for the random walk. And this exponentiated uh, Markov matrix is then multiplied against the original data to give us the imputed data. So essentially, uh, finally, as you can see that the original data matrix is uh, transformed into the imputed data matrix with the help of neighboring cells. So because this exponentiated Markov matrix it is actually representing the neighborhood of the each of the cells uh, without uh, much noise in the data. So uh, this exponentiation also helps uh, in removing some of the noise that is observed in the data. So in order to define the neighborhoods correctly, uh, this exponentiation operation is done. So let us look into this method in some more details. So the very first step is some sort of data pre-processing and in that step uh, MAGIC actually uses uh, principal component analysis. So which is again another linear dimension reduction method. So this is our input matrix and uh, this is M, cron, M cross N data matrix D where M is the number of genes and N is the number of cells. Now you see this is actually representing the manifold of the data. So which is again very much non-linear. So the question is, why do we perform PCA? So here we are just trying to perform PCA as a pre-processing step so that uh, we can represent the data in a lower dimensional space. Now, this lower dimensional space is again, we are doing a linear dimension reduction uh, on this data. And they basically choose around 20 to 100 robust dimensions for each of the cells, which basically explain about 70% variations in the data. Now here they are not very choosy about the dimension reduction method because this is the initial distance matrix. Uh, 
and this is not the matrix which will be used for imputation of the data directly from this distance matrix they will later convert it into a affinity matrix so that affinity matrix the uh, construction of the affinity matrix is the most important so they are using PCA because PCA is efficient and at this point they are just trying to compute some sort of distance between the cells so this cell cell distance matrix is denoted as dist so here also they are trying to just looking into uh, cell cell euclidean distance because uh, at this step uh, it is uh, just uh, trying to calculate some distance between the cells so in the end of this data pre-processing step you get the cell cell distance matrix where again the distance is based on euclidean distance between the two cells of course it is based on the reduced dimensional representation of each cells The next and one of the most important part of this algorithm is construction of this Markov affinity matrix. So in order to do that, it actually uses an uh, adaptive Gaussian kernel. So in the last step, we saw that uh, the distance matrix was computed between every pair of cells. And that distance matrix is now converted into an affinity matrix, which is denoted as A and uh, the ijth entry of this affinity matrix gives us the similarity between two cells. So essentially, this exponentiation is taking into account that um, similar cells uh, will have lower distance. So basically, if the distance is very high, this will become near zero. And this sigma is again uh, uh, the standard deviation of this particular kernel, this Gaussian kernel. And this is also the kernel width and we'll see how it is important so essentially uh, this particular uh, usage of the gaussian kernel is uh, taking into account that cells which are distant should have lower similarity or cells which are actually you know, whose distance is lower they should have higher similarity so that is taken into account by this adaptive gaussian kernel and you can see that with distance uh, after a certain period of time like after the distance actually exceeds the standard deviation, the affinity becomes uh, close to zero. So as I said that this is the kernel width and this is uh, the uh, way, this is a very important parameter for this adaptive Gaussian kernel. If we select a very small value of sigma, then the graph will be disconnected. So it will be very difficult to connect the graph because um, essentially uh, we are not going to be uh, connecting the, uh, we are not going to find the affinity between uh, uh, cells which are even a little bit distant. Uh, whereas if we use a very large value of sigma, then very distinct, very distant phenotypes can also get uh, collapsed. They, uh, it might be possible to find a specific uh, link between very distant phenotypes as well, cells with very distant phenotypes. And in that case, the structure will be completely lost. So we have to somehow select a proper value for sigma. And then again, a very important observation is that uh, when we are looking into single cell RNA sequencing data, some cell types are more prominent as compared to others. So for example, if you think about the stem cells, which might be uh, present in smaller amount as compared to some of the more mature cell types. So because we are taking a snapshot from the data, it's more possible that some of the mature cell types will be higher in number uh, in terms of their representation in the single cell sample. Also, in some uh, cases, some transitional cell types might also be rare, like their number might be very less uh, in the data set. So, somehow we have to account for this particular phenomena. If we, used, uh, uh, if we use a particular fixed kernel width for every cell to find its neighbor, then essentially this will be somewhat biased, biased based on the representation of the cell type in that data. So if a particular cell which is uh, present in more number or if, if a particular cell is coming from a cell type which is dominating the data set itself, then it will have a large number of neighbors. Whereas uh, a cell which is not that, uh, frequent, uh, not that um, prominent, which is present in a uh, smaller number, then uh, it will have smaller number of neighbors also. So the kernel function should be able to deal with uh, such uh, situations uh, 
So they must equalize the effective number of neighbors for each cell. So in order to achieve that, this particular method actually utilizes a separate kernel width for every single cell. So which is represented by again this thing, uh, sigma i, right? For each cell which is represented by i, it will compute up the kernel width and this kernel width will be the distance between the cell itself and its kth neighbor. Okay, so k is a, again another integer. So imagine a particular cell will have multiple neighbors, uh, right? So it will be choosing kth neighbor for that particular cell and uh, the distance will be computed. So essentially, this will help us uh, in finding the kernel width which will be wider in the sparse areas of the uh, manifold whereas it will be smaller in the dense areas so it it has some sort of equalizing effect uh, on the number of neighbors now the value of k is chosen in such a way so that um, so they tend to choose the smallest value of k such that the graph remains connected otherwise if the graph becomes disconnected then uh, there is no point so keeping the graph connected whatever be the uh, smallest value, most smallest possible value of Ka that is chosen for finding this kernel width. And they also later show that um, their method is actually robust with respect to the choice of Ka. So we have this uh, mark, uh, this uh, affinity matrix which is denoted as A, but at this point it is not symmetric. Right? So we just converted the distance matrix into the affinity matrix using the Gaussian kernel, adaptive Gaussian kernel, but it is not symmetric. However, in the random walk scenario, because we are trying to perform a random walk to find the nearest neighbors and utilize the shared information in the neighborhood to, for imputation. So it has been shown that uh, such type of data diffusion occurs uh, more efficiently if the affinity matrix is symmetric. So that's why they actually convert uh, the asymmetric affinity matrix into a symmetric one by this summation operation. So they're just uh, going to convert this affinity matrix by summing with, uh, with the transpose of the affinity matrix and then averaging them. So after constructing this symmetric affinity matrix, they are going to perform the row stochastic normalization using this particular equation, which is again, nothing but uh, normalization across the row, uh, along the row, because the entries in a particular row should sum up to one. That is the probability of exiting a particular cell uh, is, it should be one. So this is going to give us the Markov transition matrix in which the ijth entry is actually giving us the transition probability of cell i transitioning to cell j. So you see that this is actually very equivalent to the pij matrix that we have seen before. So this Markov transition matrix is essentially the matrix which uh, can specify a random walk on this nearest neighbor graph. And then at the same time you see that uh, there is possibility of self-loop. So a cell exiting, uh, ex exiting itself can also come back uh, to itself during the Mar, uh, during the random walk itself. So you see that uh, the after the normalization, the diagonal matrix is uh, very, uh, very much populated. So there is a high probability of coming back to itself because a cell is most close to itself. That is the case. And then finally, there is this diffusion based uh, process uh, on which uh, by which the Markov affinity matrix is actually exponentiated uh, to perform a graph diffusion. So essentially this exponentiation process uh, is uh, just taking the matrix Markov affinity matrix M and exponentiating it to uh, some sort of discrete value which, uh, which is noted as T, which is also known as diffusion time. So this uh, exponentiation refines the cell affinities. So once you perform this exponentiation, some of those noisy part in the uh, transition matrix are going to become also to going to going to go towards zero. So they will be filtered out somehow uh, during this exponentiation process.
So essentially this uh, exponentiation helps us to increase the weight of the similarity along the axis that actually are following the geometry of the data manifold itself. So then in the exponentiated matrix, which is again denoted by m raised to t, the ijth entry in that particular matrix gives us a probability that if we start a random walk of length t at a particular cell i, then after the random walk ends, then we are going to reach cell j. So that is given by this particular uh, entry in the exponentiated matrix. And this has a very interesting property where we'll see that it has uh, some sort of low pass filtering effect. So this Markov matrix, uh, they, are act they have very interesting uh, eigenvalues, uh, which are actually in the range of one and zero. So where the highest possible eigenvalue is one and then lowest possible eigenvalue is zero. And again, the magnitude of the eigenvalue is actually an indication of its importance in describing or explaining the nonlinear variability of the associated eigendimension. So if we exponentiate the matrix, right, and then the corresponding eigenvalues, which are other than one, will be further forced uh, down. So they are um, basically which uh, the eigenvalues, which are not really explaining much of the variations, those will, uh, their effects will also reduce. So that's how, why it has some sort of low pass filtering effect. So in the end, uh, because we are exponentiating the Markov affinity matrix, after exponentiating the phenotypically similar cells, they should have a stronger weighted entry. Whereas if there was some spurious neighbors that were um, highlighted in the original Markov affinity matrix, they should be down weighted. So by performing this graph diffusion process, we are effectively trying to capture the feature of the data manifold itself more clearly. Then finally comes the imputation step uh, after the graph diffusion. So essentially in the imputation step, uh, this is uh, a very simple information transfer from the uh, uh, neighborhood cells so that uh, the particular entries of the cell in consideration are imputed. So this is particularly done by performing a right multiplication of this uh, exponentiated Markov affinity matrix uh, by the original data matrix. So this is the equation. The imputed data matrix is basically the multiplication of the MT, M raised to T and the original data matrix. So remember that the uh, affinity matrix and the Markov affinity matrix and the exponentiation, those have been performed with the reduced dimension but while performing the imputation, we are again going back to the original data matrix, that is the high dimensional data matrix. And this is some sort of backward diffusion operation that is being performed over here. So essentially, the ijth entry of the imputed matrix is imputed based on the uh, something like an weighted average of the values of the same gene in the extended neighborhood the neighborhood that has been found using the affinity matrix and the data diffusion process. So that is how we are going to impute the, uh, perform the final imputation. So again, the exponentiated Markov matrix multiplied with the original data gives us the imputed data matrix. Uh -huh. So that was magic. Now I'll just in a uh, single slide, I'll briefly show you how it can perform uh, uh, on uh, data imputation itself. So here again, I'm showing you some data from erythro, uh, uh, like uh, the hematopoiesis, the bone marrow data. So some specific uh, markers are plotted over here. So where uh, the using different value of T, I'm showing you how the gene gene relations have been recovered. So as you see, like when the value of T is increased, it is capturing a certain uh, structure in the data, which was not originally observed with the original data matrix. But after imputation, such specific structures are actually being re recovered by magic. And they did some uh, validation experiment with uh, C, uh, like C. elegans data, which are again um, uh, model organisms with which uh, you can do some sort of validation study. Uh, 
and with the original data matrix they uh, introduced dropout 80 percent zeros and then imputed with the magic algorithm and then they showed that uh, the imputed entries are very much correlated with the original ones and in fact uh, magic actually recovered a trend time trends in the data that also they actually observed with uh, this kind of validation experiments so in short they actually validated magic on multiple data sets and different uh, in under different conditions they showed that it performs very well the smoothing uh, where they are actually choosing the nearest neighbor based on the data manifold itself is actually helping them in recovering the data matrices uh, the uh, un, uh, the zero values in the uh, matrix however there have been some uh, third party uh, studies where they actually benchmark different imputation methods and they observed that in some cases magic can have a uh, very uh, magic can actually recover um, uh, false positive correlations so which are also very strong of course uh, its true positive values are really uh, close to one so it can recover all the true values but at the same time it can recover some uh, particular matrices which are uh, really noise like not really present in the data itself so this is a particular example of that and you see that uh, so essentially with uh, larger number of neighbors or larger amount of diffusion time the false positive rate is getting higher now this is one particular example and in this particular paper they actually talked about some other method which is more conservative when um, imputing the data matrices uh, so those methods actually perform better but then again in a recent um, another study where a uh, lot of imputation methods were benchmarked they are also magic uh, performed really well under different scenario so that is all about imputation of a single cell data set so later on we'll look into some other methods for answering some other computational questions thank you